First of all, I think it just looks fun, but just to be sure. So I am a nutritionist at Stanford Hospital and I run a pediatric nutrition education program. So this is really geared towards healthy eating for kids in the new year, but I'm gonna be honest with you. This really goes for adults as well. There's no reason that this, it may look sort of very kid friendly because that's just what I'm used to doing because I do, I am actually a, a pediatric nutritionist as well, but I do also work with adults. So let me see if I can, okay. So when I was asked to give this presentation, I was, I, the first place I looked are the dietary guidelines just to give me, an, just to help give sort of some structure to this presentation. So every five years, the US government puts out the dietary guidelines. So I just use that as a reference point. So for sort of key recommendations in terms of nutrition. So a lot of you have probably seen the My Plate over the years. That was, that's put out by the government. And I like it. I think it's a really simple visual. It, it gives a very clear health message. Eat your five food groups, eat relatively similar portion sizes. But out of Harvard School of Public Health, I found this kid's healthy eating plate. There's an adult version as well. And I, oh, this is what I actually have adopted over the years because I find it much more descriptive, right? It doesn't just say eat fruits and vegetables. It says, or it visualizes, eat different colors because different colors provide different nutrients. It doesn't just say grains, it says whole grains. It doesn't just say protein, but it highlights lean proteins, things like chicken, fish, beans, nuts. And there's water, which always puzzles me why the, um, the my plate doesn't have water. And then the little red sneakers for physical activity. So one thing, I'm gonna kind of go through different topics. My first topic, my first topic is portion sizes. And this is a question I get all the time. What is a portion? You know, if you say, okay, you should have five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, what is a serving size? So there are different ways to figure out portion sizes. One is you can just weigh the food, you can measure the food, good old fashioned measuring cups. But I can tell you, people don't tend to like measuring cups. So we use easy visuals. And one way of doing it is with your hand. So if you say, okay, carbohydrates, this is for starchy carbohydrates, but also for fruits and vegetables. Your fist is about a serving, let's say, of rice or pasta. Kids have a smaller fist, so by definition, their serving is gonna be smaller than for adults. Protein is about the size of the palm of your hand. So if I were to take like a hamburger, it's about the, the size of my palm without my fingers and about the same thickness. And vegetables are basically what can fit in your hand for fruits and vegetables. So it's just a fun way to think about portion sizes without getting too complicated. Another way is using household objects. So I may have a kid who says to me, I eat a bagel every day for breakfast. Okay, that's great, but a bagel should be the size of a hockey puck. And most bagels are about the size of a couple hockey pucks, generally about three to four slices of bread. Um, another way to do it is a piece of fruit about the size of let's say a tennis ball or a baseball. So that's another fun way of looking at portion sizes. How do you know how much you should eat? When I work with adults and, and kids, especially kids, I don't like to use the word calorie too much. I use it pretty much once and that's just at this stage because what I'm really trying to tell them is food is energy, food is fuel. We're not counting calories, we're thinking about what are the best foods to fuel you? Because when you're well fueled, as you're gonna do better in school. You're gonna do better on standardized testing. You are going to have a better mood. You're not gonna be hangry. I love that expression. You are, that you're more likely to be, um, have higher self-esteem, to do better. So we really wanna encourage not just, um, we really wanna encourage healthy food choices. So calories, we'll go back to that. How do I know how many calories I need? Well, it's based on a couple things. It's based on your age, your gender, uh, your activity level. So I may have one calorie needs one day if I'm doing a two hour high intensity exercise. The next day I may be a total couch potato sitting at home. So my calorie needs are gonna differ from one day to the next. And then based on that, um, how active am I? Am I moderately active? Am I sedentary? Am I very active? And then from there, it's broken down into, okay, I have five food groups. 
based on my calorie needs, I'm going to have this many food groups per day. And that's really the essence of when you say, what is a meal plan? That's really what it is, thinking of not about counting calories, but actually counting food groups. It's a lot more user-friendly, and it doesn't have sort of the guilt associated with calorie counting. All right, another topic is energy balance, the idea of a scale. So on one end, you have all of the energy you take in. So that's energy from all your, the foods and drinks. On the other end, on the other side of the scale, are, is the energy that you expend. So we expend energy just by being alive, just by breathing, just by having our heart beat. We're expending energy. But then if you're moving more, if you're exercising more, you're expending more energy. So thinking about the scale, it's a very simple way. Okay, if I have this amount of energy in a day and my food is giving me this amount of energy, I'm balanced. But if it tips one way, right, if you're having more food than exercise, then the, the weight is going to go up. And if you're having more exercise than food, it tips the other way. So just, they're just very simple visuals to help um, reinforce the concept. Feel free, by the way, if anyone has questions along the way, since it's a small group, like feel free to just stop me. Okay, next topic. This is a biggie. <laughs> the amount of kids and adults that I see who don't eat breakfast is really, it's always shocking to me. And I tend to take out, this is probably my favorite visual that I have in my desk drawer. And I take it out and I say, okay, you don't have breakfast. So tell me, do you feel any of these things in the morning when you're trying to get through first period, second period of school? Headache, stomach ache. I had a school nurse once tell me that stomach ache was the number one reasons kids went to her office and it was largely from not eating breakfast. Can't concentrate, okay, that makes sense. Falling asleep, irritable, grumpy, that hangry, so hungry that you're angry. And often what I find when I show kids this picture is there's like a little light bulb that goes on and they're like, yes, that's exactly how I feel. And they can usually point to at least three, if not more of those visuals. And the next time I see them, they'll come back to me and they'll say, you know what? I had breakfast and guess what? I feel so much better. So and if, that's, if there's one thing I can try and change in kids, it's having breakfast. So what is a healthy breakfast, right? Not all breakfasts are the same. If you go to Donut Delight and have two donuts and a fruit punch, that's not a great breakfast. So a really simple way of thinking about it is we have our five food groups. So try and break it down and get at least three different food groups, right? You're not always going to get five. But break it down by a grain. If you can get whole grain, that's great. A fruit or a vegetable. And a dairy or a protein. And that's because protein, because dairy c contains protein. So even if you have a really simple breakfast like this, so kids will say to me, I don't have time. Okay, wait, wait a minute. How long does it take to have a piece of toast with peanut butter and some fruit? It doesn't take that long. I once had a kid who told me he can't eat breakfast because breakfast takes an hour. <laughs> so just trying to think about how can you make it as easy as possible to have breakfast is a really good strategy. The three Ps, prepare, plan and purchase. Anytime somebody plans ahead, so for example, um, for adults, I have adults often who don't pack lunch to work and they work in an environment that has a lot of fast food. And so they have to have McDonald's and pizza for lunch because they don't have time in the morning. So what if you have a strategy of packing your lunch the night before? So that planning ahead, waking up, knowing exactly what you're gonna do, really sets you up for success. Yeah, it, it is. Does it seem not a lot? Yeah, well, so then you could add to it, right? So the idea is, I, I, I tend to think of it like a puzzle, right? So you have five food groups. So let's say that wouldn't be enough. Then I would say, okay, add another food group. You don't have a dairy. Maybe you could add a yogurt or you could add a milk. That's, that's like generally when I, when I work with people, that's how I work, figuring out, okay, you're still hungry, add something else. Because it's not that you can't have more than that. That's just an idea of showing what a simple breakfast is, right? But it could be, you could say, okay, I want to have um, toast. I want to have eggs. I want to have some vegetables in my eggs. I want to have some fruit on the side. There's, the, the point is there's no one answer. There's no one breakfast that you have to have. It's just trying to find out the combination. So um, if you're having 
bread for breakfast and you're having pancakes. That may sound great, but guess what? It's the same food group. So by having just one food group, you're not getting all the nutrients that you could from multiple food groups on your plate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So intermittent fasting is, it does work for some people. So the idea with intermittent fasting is that your body is slowly burning. It's, the idea is that you're going to start burning fat for energy. Um, so there are different ways to do it. So there, I think there are like five models of inter intermittent fasting. Some can go maybe eight to 14 hours. There's another intermittent fasting where you, day, you do two days of a week fast, and then five days you eat. Um, so you, you can alternate time or days. It works for some people. That, and, and I think that's really what, what it is about nutrition that's just interesting, is somebody may find something like, that works for them, like um, um, meal replacements, like meal replacement shakes. Some people swear by them. They said, I, I have to have my meal replacement for lunch. It works for me. And that's completely fine. Yeah. So if somebody came to me and said, I wanted to do intermittent fasting, as long as they're eating enough calories and, and, it's their and the diet is balanced within a 24-hour period, it's okay. It wouldn't be for me, but I would work with someone who wanted to, who felt strongly about doing it. Um, now we're going to move to sugar. So sugar is one of my favorite things to talk about because it's very easy to get a lot of sugar. So for example, um, move this. Okay. So kids, uh, women should have about no more than six teaspoons of added sugar a day men about nine teaspoons of added sugar a day. The guidelines are sugar should be no more than 10% of your total calories. So a simple way to show you how much, how easy it is to get sugar. Let's say you had a can of Coke or Pepsi every day, just one can. One can of Coke or Pepsi contains 10 teaspoons of sugar. So right there, that one can, you've already exceeded your day's allotment for added sugar. If I were to take that one can and I would multiply it by 365 days of a year, I would end up, and I brought as an example my four pound sugar container that I have in my kitchen, that one can a day of soda would translate into 30, almost 39 pounds of sugar in a year. I thought that was, sh I've done this math so many times because I can't believe it, but it is actually true. So that's quite shocking. Um, I've also been very interested about the super size. So this was a couple years ago. I, I probably should go back because probably the sizes have gotten even larger. But the first time I went into McDonald's and I drove through the drive-thru and I said, I don't want any soda, I just want the cup. I said, I'll buy it, but I don't want the soda. So anyway, she gave me a weird look and she gave me the cup. And then I thought I can do better. I can get a bigger cup. So I went to Burger King. This is a 38 ounce cup. If I were to fill it, I mean, not including, obviously, they put ice in it, but if I were to just fill this cup with soda, and it doesn't really matter if it's Coke or Pepsi or Sprite or Mountain Dew or ginger ale. I mean, they're all relative, relatively have more or less similar amount of sugar. It would be 32 teaspoons of sugar. So that is an um, enormous amount of sugar. And when I show this to kids, and what I have them do is I have them literally take the packets of sugar and fill it in, they're shocked. And I say, that's basically like, I would give you 32 of these, you would rip it open, and you would eat it. And they don't even want to. They're like, oh, that's, that's actually kind of gross. So just being able to show them what it looks like is very impactful. Um, okay, this is actually one thing to show you. This is back in 1950. This is what a Coke looked like. I mean, this size, six and a half ounces. Okay, so the dreaded nutrition facts label. Um, before I became a nutritionist, I actually worked in advertising for quite a few years. I was actually a TV producer. It's kind of my second life. I can't believe I actually did it. And ironically, I worked for M&M Mars. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time traveling, it was kind of fun, and producing commercials for Snickers. Um, it's called Bounty in Europe, uh, Almond Joy. And finally, I did M&Ms. And my last commercial that I ever did 
was not just for M&Ms, it was for M&M minis. And this was, I was living in Amsterdam at the time. I don't know if they still exist, but M&M minis are for little kids to prevent choking. And I remember one day driving to work and thinking, what am I doing? Like, I can't spend my life making commercials to sell candy to kids. And that was like my light bulb moment. And I quit shortly after that. And this has been really good. So my goal is what I really try and do is make learning about nutrition fun. And that's why I have all this stuff here. Just, and I just want to give you some ideas because I think it's more fun to, have, to visually understand things, at least for me. I'm a very visual learner. So I show a nutrition facts label, and then all of a sudden I see all these faces um, with kids kind of go, oh, no, what is she talking about? But trying to make it fun. So we're going to talk about serving sizes. So first thing you look at is the serving size. Why? Because everything on that label is for one serving. If I have two servings, everything doubles. Um, and then you look at whatever nutrient you want. You can look, of course, at calories, but then you, depending, do you want to look at saturated fat or fiber or sugar? One thing to point out before I move on, the 520 rule. So what are those percentages? Um, you probably can't see it, but at the very, very bottom, it says the nutrition facts labels are based on 2,000 calories a day. Do we all need 2,000 calories a day? No. But that's what the government has deemed kind of an average. So just bear that in mind when you look at it. Simple rule, 520. If the percentage is close to five, it's low. If it's close to 20, it's high. So do I want it to be five or 20? It depends on the nutrient. If I'm looking at sodium, I want it to be low. If I'm looking at fiber, I want it to be high. So let me show you how that works. Oh, I threw this in too. Also with the nutrition facts label are the ingredients. And just in case you don't know, ingredients are listed by weight. So the first ingredient is the main ingredient, and then it goes down from there. So if you ever look at a label in sugar, fructose, um, hydrogenated fat, that's trans fat, is the first ingredient, or even the third or fifth ingredient, it means it's really high. All right, fat, sugar, and salt, my favorite topics. All right, so all I have to do, I look at the serving size. I say my saturated fat, my unhealthy fat, 30%, it's high in fat. Sodium or salt, 2%. It's less than five, it's low. And sugar, 24%, it's more than 20. And I can skim that label really fast and know if it's a food that it's gonna be healthy for me or not. And that's a good way, especially with packaged foods. It's a question I get a lot from parents. What do I do with snack foods? Are all snack foods bad? No, they're not all bad, but you just want to look at the label. And what you'll find very often is that one or two may be high. You rarely get all three high, right? So like potato chips, you get high fat, high salt, but low sugar. Cookies, you'd get high sugar, low fat, usually. So why is, yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. So a, a couple years ago, the nutrition facts label changed. And one really good change that was made is that they differentiated, they basically added a line between total sugar and added sugar. So total sugar, if you look at, for example, milk, there's gonna be sugar. But if you look at added sugar, it should be zero. That's what it is. So if you look at, same with orange juice, there'll always be total sugar, but there should be no added sugar. So it's between sugar that's naturally in the food versus sugar that's added. Oh yeah, in fact, I highlighted it. Uh, so one little bit of math, if you're interested in remembering this, is four grams is a teaspoon. So if I were to look at this for the added sugar, I would say, okay, four, uh, sorry, 12 divided by four, one serving of this food is gonna give me three teaspoons of sugar. Does that make sense, everyone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, pouring on the pounds, this was put out by New York State several years ago, but I do love this visual because it's so much more powerful than I, than I could ever describe it. So what is happening there? Sugar is turning to fat. So what it's showing you is if you take in, if you eat more sugar than your body is able to burn, your body will very quickly turn that into fat. But here's the thing, I could take away that soda and I could replace it with white rice, white pasta, bagel, cookies. It does the same thing. 
those starches, those grain-based foods, are broken down into sugar. So if you've ever known anyone who's diabetic, they have to be careful of starchy foods. They break down into sugar, and then they're stored as fat as well. So anyone who had maybe um, high blood sugar or have high triglycerides, they, those labs, those go up because of not only fats, well, not for sugar, but also for starches, so not just sugar. One fun experiment that you can try, if you take um, a saltine cracker, like an oyster cracker, and you put it on your mouth, and you don't bite it, you just let it sit on your tongue. And it takes a while, so I can't do this in the classroom because it takes too long. Just let it melt, and what you'll find is that initially it'll taste salty, because it's a saltine. But after several minutes, it'll start to taste sweet. And so that's really the starch starting to break down into sugar. It's a really cool experiment. No, I, well, it's certainly to replace soda, but it's just to show that it turns to fat. Because I think not everyone realizes, especially kids, that, that sugar turns to fat. Right? They say, like, oh, yeah, if I eat McDonald's and French fries, that'll turn to fat. But so will sugar and so will starches. Yeah. And also, is sugar hiding in your food? So there are many words for sugar. Brown sugar, fructose, high fructose corn syrup is a, is a really big one. Uh, high fructose corn syrup is kind of a cheaper version of sugar. It's made out of corn. And your body metabolizes it slightly different. It goes through the liver. So you're, that's more likely to cause something like fatty liver. And sadly, we're seeing a lot more cases of fatty liver in, in kids now. So just to be aware, this is ketchup. So, you know, I like these for shock value because it always gets kids to be like, oh, gross. But just to show you that there is actually, in some ketchups, a third of it is sugar. So just to know, like you may say, hey, of course there's no sugar in it, but take a look at the label because that's really how you know. And that's really my message is I'm not telling you what to eat. I'm just giving you the information so that you have the power and the, and the knowledge to look at a, at a food and decide for yourself if it's something you want to put into your body. So let, let me, I'm going to give you two examples, and I think these are kind of interesting. So, so Coca-Cola, serving size, one bottle. And then I would look at sugar. And just to your point, sir, you, the total sugar and the added sugar are both 65 grams. So what does that tell me? It tells me... It's all added sugar, okay? You guys are adults, but for kids, that takes a little bit of time to kind of comprehend. And the daily value is above 100, it's 130%. So if I were to then take that 65 grams, right? Because 65 grams, not everybody has a visual of what that looks like. So if I divide it by four, four grams of sugar is a teaspoon, I'm actually gonna get 20 teaspoons of sugar in that 20 ounce soda. And if I, if I tomorrow morning wake up and I forget all of that math, I can look at the ingredients and know that high fructose corn syrup is a form of sugar. Now let's look at something else. Now, I think because I've worked in advertising, I'm a little bit, I, I, I do feel like sometimes the food companies can be a little tricky. So don't judge a book by its cover. So what I always like to tell kids is the front is the advertisement. This is telling me I'm refreshing, I'm, I have lemon and water, I'm all natural, right? If I'm going into a supermarket, this is showing, this is facing me, right? I'm not, I'm not being faced with the nutrition facts label. So turn it around and get the facts because don't judge a book by its cover. And this is why it's interesting. This is the same 20 ounce as the Coke we just saw. But look at this, the serving size is two and a half servings. So what does that mean? Is it realistic to think I'm gonna buy this and share it with one and a half friends? Maybe, but I'm gonna guess more times than not, people are gonna probably drink the whole thing. I probably would drink the whole thing. So why is this tricky? It's tricky because if you look at the total sugar, it's not for the whole bottle, it's for one serving. So I would have to do the math. I'd have to take that 27 grams and multiply it by two point Five, right, by two and a half. And I end up getting 17 teaspoons of sugar if I were to drink the whole bottle. It, well, the Coke had 20. Oh, no, you're right. The Coke had 16. Yeah, it's worse than Coke, which is so interesting, right? Because people, kids are like, oh, I drink iced tea, I drink lemonade, I drink Gatorade. No, it has the same amount of sugar. But if you just eyeball it and you don't look at the serving size, 
with, if, you, if you had like the Coke and the lemonade, you would say, oh, this is a better choice. And then again, you can always look at the label. So water is the first ingredient, high fructose corn syrup is the second. So that tells you also it's very high in sugar. Yeah, so that's also something I get all the time is people will say, well, I'm not going to drink diet because that's so bad for me, but I'm going to drink regular. And it's almost like the, you, your choice of two evils, okay? Um, certainly, if you have, if you're struggling with weight, you're diabetic, you definitely should not have a soda because soda is pure sugar. It's what we call in nutrition empty calories. So it has calories, but the calories are empty, meaning they don't provide any nutrients. When it comes to diet sodas, I, if you want to have a diet soda, sometimes it's fine. I mean, if you look at the literature, the amount of diet, um, sorry, artificial sweeteners that we can tolerate per day is high enough that if you wanted to have one diet drink, don't tell anyone I'm telling you this, it's okay. Just be sure what artificial sweetener you're using. That's really the, the key, like staying away from um, the saccharin or aspartame. Those are two of the worst ones. I think Coke... Diet Coke, there's one that has like, um, um, I don't know if it's Splenda or Truvia, like one of the better artificial sweeteners. And then oh, somebody mentioned juice earlier. So again, if you look at juice, you may say, oh my gosh, it has 22 grams of sugar, but there's no added sugar. And again, if you forget that, you just look at the ingredients and you see there's no added sugar. because the, there's no percentage for natural sugar. Just like there's no percentage for protein. Protein is one of those nutrients that's very individual, so there's no um, recommendation, for, there's no daily value for protein. But a serving of protein, just so you know, is seven grams. All right, now I'm gonna move on to fat. Fat is more a little trickier because there are different types of fat. So there is, or good fat, I don't like to say bad fat, I like to say not so healthy fat. So I use two criteria when I look at fat. One is, is it liquid at room temperature? So fats that are liquid at room temperature tend to be healthier. And I'm gonna show you, I gotta do some experiments with you because that's that makes it fun. Um, so I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna take a little bit of, if I brought it, a little oil. All right, so oil vegetable oil, liquid at room temperature, okay? I'm gonna open that up and I'm gonna use a straw to represent my veins. I have a straw in my vein, nice and clean, blood flowing through it. So what happens? If I take out the oil, can you see it is staying in my vein? No, it's dripping out. Now I'm gonna take a solid fat fat that is solid at room temperature. So butter, for example, cream cheese. I have Crisco, which I just carry because I can carry, this can last me months and months, whereas butter can't. So I don't think most people probably use Crisco, but Crisco is actually a trans fat. And the reason why trans fat became really popular is that they create a moistness in food. So foods that have a long shelf life, like cookies or muffins, like have you ever bought muffins and They've been on the shelf for a while and they're still so moist. It's the, the trans fat creates that texture. So I'm gonna take my same vein here and now I'm gonna put it in my trans fat or my solid fat. And you see, obviously, right? Okay, so just a simple visual to, to show why. Another way, and then my other criteria for healthy fat is where does it come from? Does it come from an animal or a plant? So if you look on the left, fish is one of the exceptions because fatty fish, so things like tuna, salmon, trout, sardines, herring, um, mackerel, have omega-3, those healthy fats. But nuts, oils, avocado, really good sources of fat, and those are all plant fats. Once you get into red meat, so here's a funny, here's, here's a funny expression that someone once told me I never forgot. The more legs an animal has, the more fat it naturally has. So beef and pork, four legs, naturally has more fat than chicken or turkey, which has more fat than fish. So it's kind of a fun way to think about it. Now, 
I, I practice that you never, I'm all in moderation. I don't like to exclude food, so I always like to kind of uh, add a caveat. I'm not saying you can't ever have red meat, but just to think about it, right? If I look at bacon, I see fat. You don't need to tell me there's fat in it. So with animal fat, if you're having a steak or a pork chop and you see that visual fat around it, it's always a good idea to cut that off. And trans fat, there should never be trans fat. Now, here's an interesting thing about trans fat. If you, ever lo if you look at a food label, it should always say zero. But for some reason, the US government has decided that if a food has less than half a gram of trans fat per serving, it can say zero grams. Yeah, it's tricky, which means that if it's, let's say it's, I get a food that's just under half a gram and it says zero, but I have two servings of it, I may be getting close to a gram of trans fat and I don't even know it's happening. And a gram or two grams is too much. So how do I know if there's trans fat in my food? I actually would have to look at the ingredients. And if you ever see the word hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, that means there's trans fat. And, and trans fat, hydrogenation is the process of going from a liquid fat to a solid fat, like this. Okay, yeah. The, the beef fat, because beef in general just has more fat in it, like if you think kind of like the marbling of a steak, it's going to have more fat than chicken. Like a simple way to think about it, if you cook the, the ground beef, you're going to end up with a lot of oil or grease, right? If you cook the ground chicken or turkey, you're, it's, you're not going to get that. Right, but it's it's based. I think I, I, it's based on the fat that is naturally in that meat. Yeah, yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. I think it's just the eighty percent from based on the fat that it's this like the starting off point. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna be more in the beef. What I what I do when I cook beef like that, I I cook it. I get all the fat that starts to come out, and then I drain that fat, just to take that out. Yeah. Um, definitely the, the gold standard is the olive oil. Um, I think a, an oil that got a lot of press recently is the coconut oil. And, and really, I think that was Dr. Oz that made coconut oil very popular. The problem with coconut oil is coconuts actually have the most saturated fat from any fruit, or I think, or plant food. So the coconut oil should really just be used for flavoring but not as your main go-to oil because of the really high saturated fat content. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, I will admit I never measure out my oil, but a serving of oil, regardless of what type, is a teaspoon. So not a lot. Um, you know, if you really, if you want to be careful with fats, because fat has twice the calories of protein and carbohydrates, you could just use one of the spray, spray ones. Yeah. So milk. This is another interesting one that I get a lot of comments on because they're, 
right? We know they're different types of fat. Uh, uh, diff yeah, different types of milk. Whole milk, 2%, 1% skim. So if you look, I don't, I don't know if you can see it from there, but I'll give you the numbers. So if I look at whole milk, everything about the milks is the same. The protein content is the same. The calcium, the vitamin D, all of that is the same. The only difference is the fat. And because it's an animal fat, it's a, it's a not healthy fat. So the saturated fat percentage is 25 for whole milk. It goes down to 15% for 2% milk. 1% milk is 8%, and then skim is zero. So that's why um, the recommendation is to stick with 1% or skim milk, because the other ones are just too high in saturated fat. Any questions about milk or dairy or dairy alternatives? Are you talking for eggs or dairy? Yeah, so dairy, there, yes, there's like a movement about whole milk. And the idea, would it, the way I understand it from what it's, it's stemming from is that whole milk, because it has fat, fat slows down, slows down your digestion. And so if your digestion slows down, food stays in your stomach longer and you get that feeling of fullness longer. So the idea is that you don't eat as much because it creates a satiety. I don't agree with that because of the saturated fat. Then again, we're all individual, right? So if I'm speaking with somebody who has um, heart disease or high cholesterol, I would definitely say, don't have the whole milk. If I'm talking to a young person who's healthy, doesn't have a weight issue, heart issues, then I would say, okay, if that's what you really love. So it always depends also on who is the person that I'm speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A serving of how many coffees a day? Okay, okay, because I have people who say that and then they're like, yeah, and I have 10 coffees a day. So that should be fine. A serving of half and half is two tablespoons or it's either one or two tablespoons. Yeah. I know, I would love to say yes, slightly, right? Because it's less processed, right? So the more processed something is, the, the faster the sugar enters into your bloodstream and your sugars go up and the sugar gets absorbed and then it can turn to fat as we saw earlier. So because honey and maple syrup are less processed, it'll slow that down a little bit. But really the answer is your body does uh, metabolize all of those like honey, molasses, agave nectar, brown sugar, the same way. Yeah, but I wonder actually with maple syrup, I've never heard anyone put it in their coffee, it sounds delicious. I wonder if because it's a strong flavor, if you maybe don't need as much of it as you would sugar. I don't know. And coffee itself is fine. There's nothing wrong with coffee. It's really just what people are putting in their coffee. Uh, I was recently at Dunkin' Donuts and I had someone in front of the line who ordered a small, just regular coffee. And then she proceeded to ask the woman for 21 teaspoons of sugar. I kid you not. And I, I mean, just how long it took the woman, the Dunkin' Donuts, like scoop that in. So I didn't say anything though. All right, so now I wanna talk for a minute about the serving size. And years ago, oops, I'm on the wrong slide. Years ago, I work, I go into all the elementary schools in Stanford and I, KT Murphy is one of my favorites. And one of the PE teachers there once said to me, you have to talk to the kids about Takis. And at the time I had no idea what this food was. I had never tried it. And I said, okay, let's do it. Let's have a look. And this is why the serving size is so important because this, Seems like a single serve, just kind of like my drink. But this is for two and a half servings. How many servings are in here? They're actually four. All right, 
So I, this is always one of my favorite experiments to do with kids. So I have one, and the serving size is 12 pieces. So, right, just 12 of those. So do you think most kids would have one serving and then divvy up the last three servings for three of their friends? I don't think so. And so again, why is this so deceiving? It's deceiving because if I look at the saturated fat, it says 13%. But if I eat the whole bag, I have to multiply it by four. So it's not 13% saturated fat, it's 52. If I look at the salt, you may say, okay, it's 18, it's under 20, okay, it's not that bad. But if I eat the whole bag, I have to multiply it by four and I get 72% sodium or salt for the day. And then it becomes really unhealthy. So I actually had a major breakthrough the other day. Let me see if I have it. I went to a store and I actually found a single serve of Taki. So here it is. I couldn't believe it. So this is actually, I was so excited. This is legitimately one serving. Uh, no, it just says one, it just says the whole package. But if I look at the grams, yeah, it's 28 grams. So it's 12 pieces. So here's the thing. I could have this popcorn. You know what a serving of this is? For, uh, three and three quarter cup. I could have almost four cups of this popcorn as opposed to 12 of these, right? So that's, and popcorn's good for you. Popcorn's a whole grain. Or I could have, this is even less than that, but this, if I bought this bag, I could have the whole thing. So just by seeing that, sometimes kids are like, you know what, or your adults too. I don't know if I want just 12, because I don't think that's gonna fill me up. I'd rather have four cups of popcorn. So that's why, Serving size is so interesting. All right, let's move to salt. I know, I do, I do like Skinny Pop, actually. <laughs> All right, let's talk about salt. All right, high blood pressure. So here's my, my model of high blood pressure. So I've got my, my vein, which is nice and elastic, right? Your blood, I think of blood like a river. It's flowing through your veins, and that's why it's got to be elastic. And if your blood pressure is too high, it's like the river is starting to get higher and higher and higher, and there's too much water in it. And because of that, your blood pressure, right? Your pressure is going up. There's too much, um, too much fluid, right? Too much water in the blood. And what can happen then, as the river, your blood is going through, it starts to hit the walls of your veins and causes damage. So even if you think about like cholesterol, right? High cholesterol is when over time the fat in your blood can, hard, can start to harden, become a plaque, and high blood pressure, because it's damaging the walls of your veins, make it actually easier for that plaque to start to adhere to the walls of your veins. So salt, we don't need more than a teaspoon of salt a day. That's so little. Where's my teaspoon? Let's see. But, tea, but salt, like we've seen in the Takis, right? This, that one bag of Takis is giving me 72% of my allotted salt for the day. So salt tends to be in like processed foods for sure. Breads, deli meats, pizza, cheese, snack foods, certainly ones that have salt like nuts and saltines. So just those are foods really to be aware of and look at the label. And nowadays, every, so many foods come in low sodium. Well, you, we need sodium, right? So sodium is electrolyte, so we need to have it. And if our blood pressure gets too low, you actually want to have some fluid. So then you want to like pump back the, you know, bring back the river, get it higher up. So that's when you have low blood pressure, that's when you can start to get a little dizzy, like when you start to stand up from a chair and you feel like you're going to fall. Yeah. You may, you could try a little, a little bit more salt. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go crazy, but you certainly could try a little. Yeah. Fiber. Now, this is the one nutrient that is missing from, actually, most Americans tend to get about 15% of grams of fiber a day, whereas the guidelines for adults, for women, it's 25 grams. For men, it's about 30, 31 grams a day. 
So why is fiber important? Fiber is the nutrient that we actually don't absorb. So if you think about fiber going through your intestines, your small intestines, your large intestines, it's kind of like a broom. It's like cleaning everything out. That's why you hear on commercials, um, Cheerios has high fiber. It's good for your cholesterol. So where do we get fiber from? We get it from fruits and vegetables and whole grains, beans, seeds, nuts. We get it from skin of food, right? So if you have an apple and you peel it, you're going to have less fiber. If you have a potato and you peel it, you're going to have less fiber. If you're making mashed potatoes, keep the skin on because that's where all the fiber is. Um, so very important nutrient. Helps with constipation. It helps with cholesterol. It helps with weight loss because it gives you that sense of satiety. Whole grains. Oh, okay. I've got three breads here. I have 100% whole wheat, whole wheat, and hearty white. What's the difference? What's the difference between the 100% whole wheat and the whole and the whole wheat? There's got to be that 100% whole wheat. Because what happens if I think about if I think about a whole grain? Let me go back to this picture. If I think about anatomy of a wheat, if you think about a wheat plant, this is the kernel. That little picture up there in the green. That's this is a kernel. A kernel has three parts. It has an outer shell, which is the bran. Okay, this is where all the fiber is. It has an inside, which is mostly starch. This is kind of like, if you think of white bread, it's kind of like mushy, starchy. That's really what this is. There's not a whole lot of nutrition in here. And then in the very center of the kernel is the germ, like wheat germ. This is where um, vitamins and minerals, healthy fats are. So when a, a bread is whole wheat, it's intact. You've got all three parts. When a bread is white, these parts are gone, right, in processing, and you're just left with this piece. So what do you do when a bread says whole wheat? What does that mean? Is it 100% whole wheat or is it white? That means you don't know. That means that some of the flour in that bread is whole, but some is white. So if you want to be really healthy, just make sure that anytime you buy um, a bread, whether it's whole wheat, whole grain, that it always has that 100% at the beginning. All right, this is more meant for kids. Um, but if you ever, yeah. Yeah, it's, those are good too. But again, they just they should have like any flour that's in there should be whole. Yeah, just looking at the label. So if it just says like wheat flour, you know right there that it's not. Yeah, but those are good. Like the, what is the one that has all the seeds around it? The, um, the Dave's Killer Bread is good. The Ezekiel Bread's really good. Yeah. Um, this is, if you guys have kids or grandkids, this is a fun, or your babysitters, I don't know. This is a fun game that goes slow woe, and it's a concept of using a uh, traffic light. So foods that are go foods, the green light, are foods that you can have every day. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy, uh, lean meats, lean protein. Yellow foods are foods that are a little bit processed, but they're still, they're not considered junk foods. So that's things like white bread, white pasta, 2% milk, peanut butter. I tend to think peanut butter is a go food. I eat peanut butter every single day, but only because it has fat, I think they put it there. And then a woe food or a red light food is a food that's a junk food. And that's where you get a lot of fat, sugar, and or salt in it. And then, not to be discounted, oh, sorry. This is my healthy snacking. Again, where are you looking at the label? Um, eating mindfully. This is a big, big one. What does that mean to eat mindfully? It means <laughs> you're not doing what that person's doing. You're not multitasking and eating at the same time. Because what happens if you're, like, you're sitting down, you've got the TV on, I've got my phone buzzing, and I'm trying to eat? I'm not really paying attention to the food. I'm not listening to my body. So it becomes very easy to just keep eating. Whereas if I'm seated, um, I don't have any distra electronic distractions, maybe I'm talking to somebody, I'm using utensils, I'm more in tune with my body, I'm probably eating slower, and it's easier for my, sort of my stomach and my brain to communicate and say, you know what, you've had enough, you're full now. So that's, I actually had a, a child today who, very insightful, who told me that he eats when he plays Xbox. And he was able to explain to me that 
he understood it wasn't good because he, it was like a nervous impulse. He wasn't hungry, but he just felt like, when I play Xbox, I have to eat. So that's, that was our plan to work on that. Um, this is another idea. This is called a hunger scale. There are many different hunger scales. Some are for, you can, this is made for kids, but you, there are also ones for adults. The idea of a hunger scale is never to get to the extreme. You never want to be so hungry that you come home and what happens, right? If you're so hungry, it becomes really hard to like put on the brakes and make a healthy food choice. I found it with myself. If I come home after work and I'm hungry, I'll just like eat voraciously. I can't stop. So trying to never get to that point, always kind of staying somewhere in the middle, not getting to the point either of being stuffed. Like if you're eating a meal and at the end of it, you're like, I have stomach pain because you ate so much. That is also a sign that, you know, you should be more mindful of your portions. And model healthy behaviors. So if you're telling your kid to have an apple, but you're being a couch potato and eating a pizza, I just think it's always a funny one. Physical activity. So <laughs> what are the physical activity guidelines? So a really big one um, is, of course, you want cardio, right? For adults, it's 150 minutes a week. But there's so much research out there now about strength, muscle strengthening exercises. So, so what are those? Those are exercises where you're using, you're pushing your muscle like against a weight, like you're using elastic bands or you're using actual weights so that you are using your muscles. Because sadly, as we start to age, we start to lose muscle mass. And when we start to lose muscle mass, we start to lose strength. And we also start, our immune system starts to go down because our immune system is also tied to muscle. So really very important to maintain muscle strength. So the recommendations are about two days a week to do some muscle strengthening exercises. Bone strengthening exercises, what does that mean? That's basically when you're using your bones, you're standing, you're walking, you're using your bones, you're hitting something, hitting with a racket. So those are, those are key things, your cardiovascular, muscle strengthening and bone strengthening exercises. Sleep, also very important. Um, the amount of people I see who eat in the middle of the night is amazing. Because if you think about food as fuel, we don't need to be eating in the middle of the night because what happens, it totally disrupts your cycles. So you eat at night, you wake up, you're not hungry, and you end up eating all your food at the end of the day. And that's always um, a recipe for disaster. So just trying to get into normal eating and sleeping patterns. Yeah. You know, it's, it's soothing. So there's something, like my mother used to give me milk and honey. Is there any research to say it helps you sleep? I'm not really sure. But if, if that works for you, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's more having like a sandwich or a bowl of cereal or snack foods late at night. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's a good idea to do. Um, you know, people have different family dynamics, different cultures. There's some people who just eat really late, like that's how they've always grown up. It can be tricky, you know. I, it, if you can eat a little bit earlier, you know, it's it's the people that are eating at like nine, ten at night, and then go right to bed, that it becomes not so healthy. So if you can kind of eat it a little bit earlier, a couple hours earlier, and then try and avoid eating right before bed, um, that's really helpful. Because there, I don't know, there's something about eating before bed. People tend, I don't know, if it maybe helps with sleep, um, but it it's just working against you because you really want to make sure you wake up hungry because that's the key thing, breakfast is key. So start with that meal, and really help being healthy means eating throughout the day, every four to five hours, because you want to keep your blood sugar steady. You don't want those spikes and those valleys in blood sugar, because that's when you get irritable, tired, hangry. You don't want that. Um, and then, last but not least, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So it's easy to set goals, but the best goal I find is one where, it's called a SMART goal, where it is specific. So for example, um, 
let's say I am going to eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. That's my goal. It's measurable. So at the end of the day, you can ask me, did you do it or did you not do it? Um, I have an action plan. So my plan is I'm going to have five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. I'm going to wake up in the morning or the night before, and I'm going to have little Tupperware. I just discovered I'm very excited about these little Tupperwares. Little Tupperware. Um, one cup. And in it, I'm going to put either a fruit or a vegetable. And I'm going to have them, five of them in my fridge every day. And is my goal realistic? It's realistic, right? If I set a goal for myself to run a marathon tomorrow, that's not realistic. This is something I can do. And timely. My goal is to do this starting Monday, and I'm going to do it Monday to Friday for the next month. And so once you have a goal like that where it's specific, it's measurable, it's achievable, it's realistic, you're more likely to follow through. You're more likely to be set up for success. And that's it. Yeah. A red meat. Okay. So again, if you were somebody who had heart, heart disease or high cholesterol, you'd want to have a little bit less. Um, if you have, say, three servings of red meat a week, it's fine, right? That's okay. If you have it trimmed, um, if you're having bacon every... Right, it's just the moderation. It's like having bacon every day, not a great idea. Having bacon Sunday morning, fine. Yeah. Does three servings a week sound too little? Oh, okay. I use, yeah, generally three. You know, if you want to have a little bit more. But it's also how you prepare food, right? I, you may say, well, I eat chicken all the time. But if the chicken is fried and you eat the skin, then you're having a lot of fat there as well. So trying to have foods that are, that are not fried, no chicken skin, trim the fat. Yeah. Yeah. So water intake is based on your weight. So there's a little, yeah, so that's how we figure it out. Um, so it's, a, you want the calculation. Yeah, so you can do, one thing you can do is like 30 milliliters per kilogram, for example. Yeah, but generally about two liters. Yeah, a day, depending on their size. Yeah, I would say on average it's about two liters. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> okay, well let's say you are, are following, let's say you're following 1800 calories a day, okay? And 1800 calories a day is probably, you're giving about six servings of grain a day, okay? Now, a serving of grain is not a lot. So a serving of grain, let me just see with my little s foods here. If I can show you. A serving of grain. OK. I have some pretzels here. A half cup of pretzels, for example, is a grain. A half cup of rice is a serving of grain. Um, a slice of bread, a six inch tortilla. So it's not a lot, if, right? And then if on top of that, if I were to make sure that the grains that I eat are whole grain, so my bread is 100% whole wheat grain. I, what happened, the typical American diet is very high in processed grains. And that is one of the biggest problems is the, you know, bagels and muffins and, you know, potatoes, fried foods. Yeah, so it's, it, it's the portions, really, is I think, I think a simple way to think about it is, let's say you're having rice and chicken, okay? If I'm just having rice and chicken, I'm probably going to have a pretty healthy serving. For, no, let me repeat that. I'm probably going to have a pretty big serving of rice because I just have two foods. Whereas if you were to say, okay, I'm gonna ha I want to have less rice, so I'm going to cut my portion, it's hard to do that if you don't add something else. But if I say I'm going to cut my portion of rice, but I'm going to add broccoli or a salad, 
then all of a sudden it becomes easier because you don't feel like you're giving up the volume of food, but you're adding fiber, you're adding a very low calorie food, which is a vegetable. So that's, that's the key, is you, you know, not feeling like you're depriving yourself, but you're just replacing like a starch with something healthier. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that's a great question. So that's a kid who could benefit, for example, from whole milk, who could benefit from finding ways to add calories without adding volume. So, yeah, so different ways to do that. One is you can add things in to their food. So you can add, let's say you're making hamburgers or meatloaf, you can add in like powdered milk. You can add extra oils, right? Because fat has twice the calories as protein and carbohydrates. So you could add a little bit extra oil, extra cream if you're making a sauce or a soup. Um, finding, like you could do pow nuts are really high calories. You could do even like powdered nuts you can add to foods. So kind of like sneak things in that are just high calorie but healthy. I mean, that's the key is you want, with the foods that you do add, you want them to be healthy foods. Right. How old is your child? No. I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to have the protein powders. Yeah, I think you're better off having or just a real whole food. Like you could do peanut powders or almond flour, which is more natural. F uh, flax seeds, chia seeds are great because they're protein, they're fiber, and they're high calorie. You know, powdered eggs to foods. Those, those would be better options. Even something like um, nutritional yeast is another one where you can add... Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. But mi mostly things like oils and avocado. If, they li if she likes avocado, that's a great one too. Yeah, cheese. Yeah, but that's another. Um, or, sh you know, you can always try one of the supplements, like um, a boost or carnation instant breakfast. Sometimes kids benefit from just having one a day because they're, they can be really high calorie, high protein if she needs it. All right, anyone else? Thanks, you guys. That was great. I really appreciate you all coming tonight, making it out here. <laughs>